Each week, the Bible as Literature podcast brings you in-depth discussion of the biblical text in a format short enough for your morning commute, but long enough to be substantive, posing difficult questions meant to keep you engaged. If you value this work, please consider donating as little as 25 cents per episode. That's just $1 per month. To learn more, please visit patreon.com forward slash Bible. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com forward slash Bible. Thank you. Hi. This is Father Mark Bulos with the Bible as Literature podcast. When it comes to bowing, our culture is schizophrenic. We teach people not to bow down to others or to let others tell us what to do, yet we bow down all the time. We bow to men of wealth. We bow to people and things of beauty. We bow to eloquent speech. Worst of all, we bow to power. Military power, economic power, and individual power. When Jesus entered the country of the Gerasenes, he encountered a man with the same brand of schizophrenia. On the one hand, he was a man who bowed to no one, a man who could not be controlled or subdued, not even with a chain. No one could tell the Gerasene what to do. He was exactly the kind of man our culture applauds, yet, when Jesus stepped off the boat, this same man, rather the unclean teaching controlling him, groveled at the feet of Jesus. Why? Not because he placed all his trust in the Lord's seed, but because, like everyone else in Mark, he was afraid of Jesus' worldly might. Like the people who marveled at Jesus' miracles, like the fearful disciples, the garrison was impressed with the wrong thing. So he bowed to Jesus the way a sycophant bows to Silicon Valley. The letters of St. Paul teach us that everyone has to bow down. Even Jesus will eventually bow to Pontius Pilate. In Mark's Gospel, the question is not, should I bow? But why are you bowing? Do you grovel before Jesus because of the teaching he proclaims? Or are you bowing to something else? Richard and I discuss the Gospel of Mark, chapter 5, verses 1 to 13. You're listening to the Bible as literature. Hi, this is Father Mark Bulos. And this is Dr. Richard Benton. And you are listening to episode 157 of the Bible as Literature podcast. We've been getting questions on Facebook. A lot of you have sent us chat messages. We appreciate it. If we haven't gotten back to you yet, Please don't worry, we are working through and will respond as soon as possible. We read all of the comments and questions that we get, so please keep them coming. We're going to continue with the Gospel of Mark today. And I was telling Richard this morning, whenever we talk about a reading that appears frequently in the liturgy, I always try to take a step back and challenge myself not to assume that I've already figured out the passage. People who are studying Scripture for decades and decades and decades don't stop learning new things about what Scripture is saying. They don't stop making new connections. They don't stop continuing to read constantly. Don't say, I've got the Bible down, now I can move on to the next thing. The next thing is nothing unless it's constantly being informed by Scripture and one is constantly learning from Scripture and what it has to say. What does the Bible teach, people ask me? My answer is very simple. It teaches you to read the Bible. What does the Bible say? It says, read me, hear me, study me. And it's only by hearing and studying and doing that you will grow in the wisdom of the text. This is why so far in Mark, one of the central themes has been the seed going out, the seed going out, the seed going out. The the farmers does not plant one time. The farmer has to plant every year. He has to get more seed for the next year and more seed for the next year. You're never done with the seed. So if you're going to continue to prosper in a worldly sense, you need to buy more seed. If you're going to continue to prosper in the spiritual sense, in the godly sense, in the biblical sense, you have to constantly be sowing the field with the seed that scripture sows. And you have to trust the seed, as we learned last week, to such a degree 
that when the waters lift up against you in Psalm 93, you know that the testimony of the Lord will overcome the threat of the waters. They came to the other side of the sea into the country of the Gerasenes. The country of the Gerasenes is east of the Jordan, so we are in the post-apocalyptic land of Elijah and Elisha. We've gone beyond the Jordan. The mantle has been carried forward, and we're now among the nations. Out of the land of promise into the land of the Gentiles. East of the Jordan. When he got out of the boat, immediately a man from the tombs with an unclean spirit met him. So Jesus now has stepped off the boat on the other side. He's now in enemy territory. And just realize from our reading of 1 through 4 so far that Jesus is not getting off the boat so he can heal people. He is getting off the boat so he can spread the seed. In the territory of the Gentiles, he's going further into pagan territory. The Romans control the whole area, including Jerusalem. He's moving into the greater territory to spread the word, to spread the seed outside of the land of Israel. It's as though he's in a battle and he's hitting them on their turf. And he had his dwelling among the tombs, and no one was able to bind him anymore, even with a chain. So he is a person who lives in an unclean place, and he's out of control. It's like John Chrysostom talks about people who love money. A man who loves money is like a wild beast. And that's who Jesus is encountering here, a wild beast, a person who because their will has not been subdued by God's instruction is just living an unclean reality, an uncontrollable reality. Right, I think the uncontrollable is the important part because remember in the last scene, Jesus was confronting the uncontrollable storm and quieted it. Now he's up against a person, we only know two things about him, he has an unclean spirit and he can't be bound. He's uncontrollable. So this unclean spirit that's uncontrollable as opposed to the dangerous seas and storm which are uncontrollable. Because he had often been bound with shackles and chains and the chains had been torn apart by him and the shackles broken in pieces and no one was strong enough to subdue him. He is an uncontrollable force. He is beyond human control. This is a difficult verse for Americans to understand Because if you were to take this out of context and put it on a meme on Facebook, everybody would like it. They tried to chain him. He kept breaking his chains. No one could hold him back. We think of that as a virtue. But here in Mark, it's exposed as being destructive. A man, scripturally, is someone who can take orders. A man is someone who puts himself under someone else, puts himself under authority. This is exactly opposite of what the post-World War II generation taught. They taught that a man is someone who does not submit to authority. They tried to put a hood on him and put him in a black site, and he couldn't be bound there. Exactly. So where are we? How did it work out? My question to the post-World War II generation, convinced that their parents didn't know what they were talking about, is the world that you've handed down to the next generation better than the one you've received? Now... If I lived a hundred years ago, I could have told you the answer was no, because I trust the seed. But you really believed that you could do something better than your parents. I ask you, look at the world today. What did you achieve? It's just a question worth consideration. Constantly, night and day, he was screaming among the tombs and in the mountains and gashing himself with stones. He's hurting himself. He's destroying himself. He's showing all the signs of being mentally ill. So this person is just beyond the purview of the quote, normal person, unquote. He is unclean. He can't be contained. He hurts himself. He goes and he wails among the mountains. He's a human, but a beast at the same time. Seeing Jesus from a distance, he ran up and bowed down before him. And shouting with a loud voice, he said, What business do we have with each other, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I implore you by God, do not torment me. This man would bow to no one in the story, but he bowed to Jesus. Now, often preachers jump on this and say, See, everybody knows Jesus is God. Even the demons bow to him. But you have to be more careful when you hear these texts. 
Because remember, the last time the demons got excited about Jesus, they were shouting fire in a crowded house because they wanted to obstruct Jesus. So the demons that are controlling this poor man have an agenda. They don't want Jesus to mess with them. So they are bowing to Jesus the way a sycophant bows to someone to try to get what they need by appeasing someone's ego. And it's self-preservation, obviously. Do not torment me. Don't hurt me. Don't do anything to me. Yes, they recognize Jesus' power, but they don't trust in him. This is the difference. Saying they bow down to him, that's great. But just because you bow down to him doesn't mean you're not going to go turn bow down to someone else afterwards. In Hosea, the people are bowing down to God. The only problem is 10 minutes later, they're bowing down to another god. The test in Mark is not whether you bow down to the mighty one enthroned coming in glory against the waters. The question in Mark is, do you bow to the mustard seed, which is his testimony? Do you submit to the testimony? Do you accept that something that appears weak actually has the power to overcome the might of Caesar? That is Mark's question. And so here, clearly... They're not interested in the mustard seed or bowing with respect to the mustard seed. They are bowing out of the same fear that governed the apostles in the previous story. For he had been saying to him, come out of the man, you unclean spirit. So Jesus already was giving the command. So Mark is doing a strange thing because he moved things out of chronological order. So he started with the response and then followed up with the original statement. He's putting an extra focus on the way that the demons are responding to Jesus. It's interesting because the disciples and the demons respond similarly. Jesus, son of God, we're completely dependent on you to save us. When they're on the waters, Jesus gets angry at the disciples because they don't actually believe in the power that is given to Jesus. Here, again, they're trying to use Jesus, son of the most high God. Oh, maybe if we can manipulate the son, maybe we can get his father to do our bidding. This is what they're trying to do. It's a manipulation that happens. They act like they're bowing down to him, but they won't actually obey him. And he was asking him, what is your name? And he said to him, my name is Legion, for we are many. And here the word Legion, to make a long story short, is a reference to the Roman armies. The Romans are occupying Palestine. The Romans dominate the region. Jesus is taking on the Romans. He stepped off the boat to do battle with the Romans in fulfillment of Psalm 93. And he began to implore him earnestly not to send them out of the country. So now the man who is besieged by the unclean spirits is begging Jesus not to send the Romans out of the country. But we have to remember, they are not bowing down to him in submission. They're bowing down to him to manipulate him. Because if they were actually submitting to him, they would have left already, and we wouldn't have this discussion at all. Now, there was a large herd of swine feeding nearby on the mountain. The unclean spirits implored him, saying, send us into the swine so that we may enter them. Give us someone to control. The man began with an unclean spirit. That's what we learned in verse 2. Now we see that it's an entire legion. So there's a, a transformation actually that happens here where we go from an unclean spirit to a Roman legion. Paul often talks about the corruption of the people when we looked at Corinthians. The Roman teaching, the Roman mentality is what corrupted the people so that they were unable to follow the gospel anymore. Jesus is here functioning as seed, not as healer. Jesus gave them permission, and coming out, the unclean spirits entered the swine, and the herd rushed down into the steep bank into the sea, about 2,000 of them, and they were drowned in the sea, just as the tombs implied uncleanness, which is an indication that you were in Gentile territory. The swine imply uncleanness, which is a reminder that you are in Gentile territory, that Jesus is dealing with the Gentiles. Last week we said... You couldn't rush to make a connection with Exodus. But this week it's clear Jesus is having a confrontation with the armies of Caesar, and he is drowning them in the sea the same way he drowned the armies of Pharaoh. Right. As soon as we see drowned in the sea, we see 2,000 soldiers being drowned in the sea. We can't help but recall 
Exodus. So what Jesus is doing is he's sending not the army of Pharaoh, but the army of Caesar into the sea to drown it. And this is after they tried to manipulate him to get him to leave them alone. He let them go into the swine, drowning themselves in the sea. And the idea that, oh, we should be impressed because the demons are bowing down to Jesus is not supposed to be impressive to us because we're not supposed to be impressed by Pharaoh's army. We're not supposed to be impressed by the Romans. We're supposed to be impressed by the one who submitted himself to Caesar and thereby showed his power. The only way that this man was saved was because the teaching that he had, which was the corrupt teaching of the Romans and the army, was replaced by the true teaching, the seed of Jesus, as that old seed was destroyed. So let's be serious about the text. God did destroy the armies of Pharaoh. And the implication here is that the disciples run the risk of being akin to the swine that were put into the water because they fear the same thing that the unclean spirits working in this poor man feared when they first saw Jesus, the threat against their own existence. So again, we've mentioned that many of you have been reaching out on the podcast. That is wonderful. Please do. We are on EphesusSchool.org. You can reach out to us right from there on Facebook, whether you comment on our website or on Facebook. Join the dialogue. Thanks very much. Thank you, Father. You've just heard the Bible as literature. Thanks for listening. The Bible as Literature is a production of the Ephesus School Network.